as I said, both in Washington, D.C. and around the world for the RSD 12. Um, my name is Jar Osborne, and thanks to Evan and the organizers, of course, to putting this all together um, for our, our final culminating hub. Abby Covert is an information architect who has a mission to make the world clearer, a clearer place, one sense maker at a time. She is an author, a teacher, a mentor, and a community organizer, and she aims to make information architecture and sense making skills accessible to everyone from absolute neophytes who have a, uh, a mess that they're wishing to make sense of to the most experienced designers and those who wrestle with complex problems on a daily basis. To quote Abby, I believe information architecture has the power to make the world a clearer place. And I would say a better place thanks to her work. She's the author of two books, How to Make Sense of Any Mess and Stuck, Diagrams Help. And both of these books are written with a fantastic combination of wit, insight, humor, and clarity to help you cut through messes and, and uh, solve the problems that you are wrestling with. She's also a founder of the SenseMaker Club uh, and the inventor of World Information Architecture Day, a past president of the Information Architecture Institute uh, for which she ran and produced a number of events. She's a founding faculty member uh, of the Products of Design Master's Program at the School of Visual Arts, the SVA in New York City, and finding, founding curator of the Design Operations Summer and the Advancing Research Conference. And then most, uh, well, not most importantly, but and additionally, she hosts an annual get together called Make Sense Mess, uh, which is, uh, will take place in a, in a few weeks, which is an annual celebration of sense making. And that will take place on November 4th this year. Uh, each year, she works with some brave sense makers to share their stories of how they have made sense of messes. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Abby for her presentation, uh, where she will introduce us to five of the superpowers that diagrams give anyone trying to make sense of a complex problem. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, JR. That was a wonderful introduction. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see everyone. Uh, it sounds like y'all are having a nerdy good time, and I really appreciate being here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, which I can assure you is the most difficult part of my job. If someone could just let me know if they could see my screen, that would be amazing. I can't see cameras, so an audio audible would be nice. I did one time get 20 minutes into a talk and then somebody told me that I never had my shared screen. So I'll just wait <laughs> for confirmation. Um, I can see this. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I wanna to talk today about diagrams and to start our conversation about diagrams, I wanna ask you what I think is a pretty human question. When was the last time that you felt stuck? I think you know that feeling, the one where you're trying to work through something or understand something, but all you feel is a sense of being stuck instead. Now this feeling is not unique, I assure you. It comes for all of us, not just once, but many, many times. We feel stuck hundreds, if not thousands of times at school, at work, or in our personal endeavors. Now maybe that feeling hasn't visited you lately, or maybe you're even feeling stuck on something right now. When we're physically stuck, we have these tried and true tools to rely on, like the jaws of life or life rings, tugboats, and tow trucks. But what do we turn to when we just feel stuck? Well, like emotional tow trucks, diagrams have been helping people feeling stuck for hundreds of years across industries, fields, and cultures. So today, I wanna to talk to you about how diagrams might help the next time you feel stuck. In 2021, I was called on to care for a family member who had just undergone life-saving surgery. My job was simple enough, pick them up from the hospital, drive them home, and keep them clean, fed, and rested until another family member could take over the next shift. But I remember that stuck feeling starting before we even left the hospital. It felt like every few minutes, someone would stop by their room and drop a pamphlet or demo a cleaning procedure, all of which I would need to keep track of on behalf of my pretty doped up family member. By the time we got to their house and I got them settled into a bed for a nap, that feeling of a bit stuck had escalated to a feeling of total overwhelming, naggy, sticky stuckness. So I brought in everything from the car and I confronted the pile of instructions and medical equipment and medications that we had amassed. It was such a mess. 
Now, as a professional information architect who happened to have written two books on making sense of such messes, I knew exactly where to start, make piles. Taxonomy tends to be my first line of defense when I am feeling totally overwhelmed. By taking a big pile and making smaller ones, I always get to a calmer place. So I made a pile of things we needed to know right now, things that could maybe wait a bit, and finally, a pile of things that we could likely just ignore. Now, once I had the pile of what we needed to know right now, things were clearer and a little less of a mess, but that stuck feeling persisted. I still had no clue where to start in understanding what I needed to actually do. I knew that even though we had 12 weeks of recovery, every day would be some set of predictable steps that we would need to take and decisions that we'd need to navigate. So I started there. I took out a sheet of paper and I drew a line to represent a single day. Then I confronted the pile of what we needed to know right now, and I tried to relate each instruction, piece of equipment, and medication to a time of day or a rhythm in time. By the time my family member woke from that nap, I had a simple diagram of what each day would look like for them going forward, regardless if I was the one doing the caretaking for them. I was able to show it to them while briefing them on what we had brought home from the hospital and what they would need to pay attention to now versus later. That simple diagram not only left me feeling less stuck, it also kept the patient from ever having to feel that particular version of stuck. And when the next family member arrived to take over a few days later, I was able to use that diagram again to walk them through what they needed to do to keep things on track every day. Now, after practicing information architecture professionally for two decades, and two decades more as just a human making sense of messes daily, I have found that diagrams are one of the best tools that we can turn to when we're feeling stuck. So what is a diagram? Simply put, a diagram is a visual representation that helps someone, even if that someone is you. The doodle to illustrate a point in a meeting, diagram. The simple map used to highlight where that birthday party will be next weekend, diagram. The simple instruction manual that you use to put together the bookcase, it's a diagram. The visual that that team used to get to that big goal, that's right, folks, it's a diagram. But wait, if diagrams relate to that many paths, when are we actually taught how to diagram? And are we ever taught what it takes to make a diagram be good? For too many people, the answer is never and no, and I really wanna change that. In late 2020, I started to write what I was calling a short book about diagramming. By early spring of 2021, I knew I had better drop the word short. The more I look, the more I understood that diagrams are a huge concept, one that wasn't brought to humanity by a single author, method, context, or field. And as is true in most things that are truly helpful, diagrams emerged from a myriad of fields, contexts, and specialties. Early in my process, I engaged a research librarian, Jenny Benevento, to help me to conduct a thorough literature review of diagrams. We identified the eight fields listed here just to get us started. Now, I had read a lot about diagrams, and I had spent more than my requisite 10,000 hours diagramming and teaching others to diagram. But in terms of academic rigor, I had stitched together a rather unique quilt of diagrammatic experience and education, and it was really limited by my own context. But when you've reached the end of what you think you can find or know, ask a librarian. They will always find more and better. The main point that Jenny helped me to understand was that diagrams have emerged from so many disparate and far-flung places over time that no one's really looking at diagramming as a craft for one to hone outside a specific context. If I was to oversimplify the resume of diagramming, I would say diagramming as a practice started in the making of maps, both physical and conceptual, went on to revolutionize how humans think about and practice maths, and then went on to get everyone on the same page as we built machines and later metadata. Most recently, diagrams have become so much a part of the zeitgeist that we can collectively understand and laugh at Instagram accounts and toilet books that are full of diagram memes. We even put diagrams on our walls and as our, on our coffee mugs as art. Now this might look like a tightly curated historical trajectory in hindsight, but in reality, diagrams have emerged over time from so many sources without much overlap or cross-learning at all. This is because diagrams are so good at helping when we're stuck that we often think of them as the result and not the process. But not many professional contexts remain diagramless today. 
There are many books, blogs, and courses to take on different types of diagrams in the context of any number of fields, contexts, and specialties. You can learn to make process flow diagrams and find multiple volumes on the agreed to standards body that one should use. You'll learn early in your engineering or medical education that decision flow diagrams are invaluable tools in planning and diagnostics. You will not get through the first semester of any advanced science, math, or management program without learning about how we visualize numbers in charts and graphs to gain further insight. And should you attend a class in interaction design, graphic design, user experience design, service design, product management, or any other number of emerging or established fields, you will surely be taught about types of diagrams that work in specific contexts. And should you go for a business degree or take a course in public speaking or influence, you will surely run into wisdom on making things visual and the use of diagrams to cut through the chaos and get to the point. Now, regardless of the field or context in which you'll be diagramming, in order to teach you the power that diagramming holds, I need to first introduce you to the villain in our story. There's a common set of forces that, led, that lead to this all too familiar stuck feeling. And this common set of forces was made memorable and quite witchy to pronounce as the acronym VUCA by the US Military War College in the 1980s. Now this acronym was created to describe delicate and critical conditions during the Cold War, but it's since come back into fashion in recent years for perhaps obvious reasons. I think of these global forces as pretty corollary to the personal signals that we might look to as to when diagrams or diagramming might be a helpful tool for us to lean on. According to VUCA, the fearsome foursome of what leaves us feeling stuck is volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And for each of these forces, diagrams have a not so secret superpower that we can harness to help us face that force with more confidence and less anxiety. According to my research across a wide swath of diagramming contexts, for many fields, situations, and roles, diagrams hold some pretty serious superpowers. So now that we have a better sense of what diagrams are, how they came into fashion, and when we might feel stuck enough to need one, I want to introduce you to five superpowers that I've identified that make diagrams the helpful superhero in many sense-making stories. Number one. Diagrams provide stability in the face of volatility. Volatility is the uneasy feeling that we get when there's a lot of change or potential for change. It's what we find at the emotional depths of life's biggest shifts and existential moments. And in times of volatility, we seek stability. Diagrams can be like a bridge over the chasm of volatility. Think about the common phrase, get everyone on the same page. It's kind of like the page is a life raft for everyone to figuratively stabilize on. Now, in my experience, diagrams are one of the best life rafts for crossing the sea of volatility. Let's look at this example from Aaron Malone working for the Anti-Defamation League to use diagrammatic expression to provide needed stability in one of the world's most volatile ecosystems, cyber hate. On their website, the ADL expressed their intention for this work as follows. By visualizing the online hate ecosystem, we can create a shared vocabulary around how online hate arises, the reasons why people engage in hate, the targets of that abuse, the forms the abuse takes, the tools and platforms used to commit or mitigate abuse, and the damaging consequences of hate. This work serves as an excellent example of the stability that diagrams provide in volatile environments. Sending a team out into the wild without a map would never be plan A. Aaron and the team at the ADL did a real service to the world by creating this very clear page for more and more people to get on as they work to tackle the cyber hate crisis. Number two, diagrams provide transparency in the face of uncertainty. Uncertainty is the mounting sense of doubt about the future that can develop when we're facing a period of unpredictability or decision-making ahead. When times are uncertain, transparency helps tremendously. Diagrams can at least tell us what there is to know, even if the news is not good. And for many of us, facing uncertainty is more palatable when we know that we have all of the information available, or perhaps even more importantly, all the same information as everyone else. Diagrams are often the form that information transparency takes, with visuals being used to translate concepts into a clearer, more accessible form that we can grasp even with lim limited certainty or experience with the subject matter. 
My next example is from a book called Extra Bold, a feminist, inclusive, anti-racist, non-binary field guide for graphic designers. This piece is called The Social Construction Zone, and it was created by Jennifer Tobias and Akshita Chandra. This beautiful and clear diagram valiantly attempts to tackle the uncertainty of social justice work through transparently cataloging and visualizing the forces and factors that intersect to create clearly paved roads towards systemic oppression. Using words alone when tackling topics like poverty, ableism, racism, and sexism invites all sorts of dis and misinformation that can predictably get in the way of progress and change. This diagram serves as a transparent map of the concepts that we're meant to consider the impact of. It uses the dual coding of words and pictures to reinforce the vocabulary of oppression it is outlining. Now in recovery, the first step is admitting that there is a problem. This diagram is shepherding us down the path towards taking that first important step. It does not propose solutions. It instead demands that we admit that there is a problem by providing a transparent map of a very uncertain societal problem set. Number three, diagrams provide understanding in the face of complexity. Complexity is an inescapable reality of everyday life. Everything you see around you is complex if you are looking hard enough. And at this point in my life, if I have learned one thing that I am more certain of than anything else, it's that we can't understand the complexity of everything. And if we try, we will much more likely fail to understand anything fully at all. Simply put, the complexity will always win, and we need boundaries to survive it. Diagrams are the boundary-defining tool that many people, teams, projects, and purposes need to move forward. To talk about the complexity of understanding, I want to talk about the absolutely delicious diagrammatic drama that has now ensued for the last half century over the appropriate level of complexity that's needed for the riders of the New York City subway system. This quote from Mark Wilson's Fast Company piece of the controversy describes it best in brief. In 1972, celebrated graphic designer Massimo Vignelli simplified New York City's snaking subway system into a clean diagram that traded geographic literarity for graphic clarity. It's a design masterpiece, and yet it has one big shortcoming. It's something of a lie. The locations of lines on the map don't align with real life. So in 1979, Michael Hertz Associates created the primary map that the MTA still uses today. Now, Vignelli's version of the subway map did not even last five years before the riders of the New York City subway demanded understanding over simplicity when faced with complexity. It's worth saying that while the Vignelli map was hated by New Yorkers, the Hertz map came with its own set of challenges of the understanding kind, namely that it chose to condense needed information about individual subway line distinction that the Vignelli map actually provided clearly. I love this particular wrinkle of the story because it further proves that simplicity is not always the answer to complexity but understanding often is. And the story does not end there for this drama. More recently, Work & Co. redesigned the map again to work better in the New York City Transit app. And now that we have phones in our pockets with the ability to have embedded in ever deeper levels of information on demand, the Vignelli diagram provided better inspiration for that high level map, as opposed to the Hertz diagram, which would feel overwhelming if shrank to the scale of a phone. As Wilson continues, the app is basically the Vignelli map, but scaled to fit accurately onto a real map of New York City, like the Hertz. That means it's an easy to read line map that also conveys where you are in the city at any given moment, so you're less likely to be disoriented. Now in this version, which has been lauded by the press under such bold headlines as MTA Live Subway Map is a modern design masterpiece, the key is focusing on understanding. Vignelli was focused on the aesthetics of simplicity, and Hertz was obsessed with information, however overwhelming, but it was understanding that was needed to tame this kind of complexity. This story is not only a great example of understanding as a diagrammatic superpower, it's also a needed reminder that a diagram can only be judged in context to a specific audience, time, and place. The same diagram that was hated by New Yorkers of the 1970s can serve as the perfect starting place for New Yorkers of today. Number four, diagrams provide clarity in the face of ambiguity. Ambiguity is the feeling we get when something's open to interpretation, enough that we aren't sure if our interpretation is the same as everyone else's or what it ought to be. 
When we feel ambiguity on the rise, we often go looking for clarity whenever we can find it. Now think about the last thing you tried to put together that came with an instruction manual. There are likely times when you knew where something went and other times where it was more ambiguous and you were less clear about what to do. Diagrams are great at providing needed clarity to help an audience face an ambiguous situation with more confidence and hope for a good outcome. But rather than show you a good example of an instruction manual, I couldn't write a talk touching on diagrammatic clarity without acknowledging the unbelievably ambiguous situation that we all found ourselves living in during the rise of COVID-19. For those in the US, the New York Times interactive visualizations on COVID numbers has provided both alarm and solace in waves since early 2020. We've looked to these diagrams when deciding what to do and what not to do, who to see and who not to see, and while we might not all agree on the answer to those important questions, we could at least all start from the same data set, meant to provide clarity in a sea of raging ambiguity. One of my favorites in this visualization set is this heat map approach. They've taken bodies of statistical data from all over the country and made them clear for more people by color coding a map that we can all understand because we've become accustomed to it since grade school. It's a map of our country on various levels of fire. This map doesn't tell you what to do. It doesn't make judgments or political statements. It simply tells you clearly how much of this ambiguous fire is raging at the moment near you or your current point of interest. But for every good example of color coding is a bad example, or 50. It turns out that in making individual color coded guidance for each state to provide clarity, the United States as a whole inadvertently created more ambiguity. As Katie Weaver of the New York Times cheekily laid out in this piece from April 2021, uh, titled The Unmitigated Chaos of America's Attempt at Color-Coded COVID Guidance. In California, the color of suffering is the juicy purple of seedless grapes. In Alabama and Alaska, it's blood colored. Blue signifies safety in many states, unless that blue is navy and you're in Utah, in which case it communicates total catastrophe, the worst conditions possible. In New Mexico, nothing is better than green, except for the color the governor's office used to call green plus before it was changed to turquoise. Now, if the color of suffering didn't paint a bleak enough picture of this drama over color coding, perhaps the headline purple mountain travesties will do you in? This example, more than any other in this talk so far, reinforces the use of diagrams as essential tools for the creation of clarity in ambiguous situations but it also reminds us of the lesson about the increased ambiguity that can come along when we don't encode our diagrams in meaningful enough ways to be clear. It also reminds me of the adage that just because you can color code something doesn't mean you should, which I assure you is a concept most students learning diagrams need to learn early and be reminded of often. In 2021, while teaching this workshop on diagramming uh, for students at MICA, I attended a critique of a student who was struggling with the hierarchy diagram seen here on the left. It had become so unmanageable that they had resorted to color coding it, thinking that would make it more clear. Instead, it made it much more ambiguous. But it turned out they just needed to be introduced to the idea of vertical bracketing in hierarchies, which allowed the diagram to stand all in one shade, increasing the clarity immediately. So after I matched the witchy foursome of VUCA forces with those four heavy hitting diagrammatic superpowers, I was pretty confident that I had something exciting to share. So much so I almost went on my merry way, but the universe told me to look a little harder and I'm sure glad that I did. I mean, I don't wanna get dramatic. It doesn't take cosmic intervention when matching an acronym for a counter acronym to be created. And I will of course admit that I was hopeful that these four superpowers might spell an acronym that could be memorable maybe enough to help the content to stick. But when I saw the acronym for those four superpowers as S-T-U-C, I knew immediately what that completionist K stood for. Number five, diagrams are a kindness when we feel stuck. Now, dear listener, I don't know how well you know me at this point, so I feel the need to stop and say, I do not birth acronyms into this world without care. I am more slayer of acronyms, mother of controlled vocabularies. Even more than that, I do not append core principles onto acronym sets just to make neat and tidy words appear. Unless, of course, I have had a very clear signal from the universe to do so. I tell you this to say as clearly as I can, I do not add this fifth superpower at all lightly. This is not a throwaway. 
Untangling this superpower was more of a lightning bolt of realization about the nature of diagramming and less a completionist seeking a memorable hook for her forthcoming book. When I was interviewing people about their diagrammatic adventures, there was this energy and excitement woven through each of their stories. It felt like when living their best and most helpful lives, diagrams do take on a sort of mythology. As a diagrammer myself, this mirrored my own experience. I have felt the kind sense of relief that diagramming and diagrams can bring. I've experienced the kind place that a diagram can provide for people to dig deeper, be more curious, and make more progress than they can with words or in their heads alone. I started to realize that diagramming is often a kindness, maybe more often than any of the other superpowers if I'm being bold, which I am. Diagrams allow us to take our time while remaining focused on the bigger picture, like walking away from a jigsaw puzzle, knowing that we can come right back to it. We can emotionally hit pause when things get deep or weird or scary. We can take a bathroom break or a walk or go get a coffee. It'll still be there for us, ready to return and trudge ever further. The impact of this kindness becomes even more healing when we're digging deep with others and know that we can pause or slow things down at any point while always maintaining our ability to jump right back to where we were. With a diagram, we always have that same page for us all to get on. And this is not only a kindness to our colleagues and collaborators, but also a kindness to our own bodies, minds, and spirits as we tackle ever more VUCA-fueled, urgent, and often personal challenges. In 2010, I moved to New York City. And in the early days, a good friend of mine and longtime resident, Carl Collins, met me for coffee. I shared with him how absolutely treacherous the city was to get a hold of, especially while looking for the right place to call home. There were so many neighborhoods and funny acronyms for the overlap of neighborhoods and transit details, and everyone had this shorthand, and I could not seem to pick it up and put it into use. But during our chat, I narrowed in on wanting to live downtown, and he suggested that as a kindness to myself, perhaps I focus on just getting familiar with everything between Canal and 14th Street tackle the rest of Manhattan once I had a handle on my entry-level slice. Then he helped me to draw this simple map of New York City in my journal. And like Vignelli's MTA map, this diagram was definitely a bit of a lie. It didn't at all attempt to cover everything that this slice of Manhattan had to offer. But for me, a new resident navigating mostly on foot looking for four rent signs, it was a kindness that I needed to get me to that next stage of feeling like a real New Yorker. Years later, I cherished this drawing while also being able to point out the hilarious oversimplifications and inaccuracies that only a downtown resident of five years could see in hindsight. Even my handwriting looks unsure. Now, sometimes diagramming is a kindness that we give to ourselves to get our bearing on something that we're stuck on. Sometimes diagramming is a kindness that we can give to others by translating something that has them stuck into something that helps them to move forward. From the very start of my book project, even when I was still referring to it as a short book about diagrams, I knew I wanted to tackle the emotional process of diagramming, not just the mechanical part. What I've learned since is that we can't tackle the emotional part of pretty much anything without giving and receiving kindness. Not only did that completionist K leave space for a lesson I desperately needed permission to learn myself and include in my diagrammatic teaching, it also revealed the simple everyday word that I had been searching for to describe that feeling for when a diagram is needed. Diagrams help when we feel stuck. Diagrams provide stability when we face volatility, transparency when we face uncertainty, understanding when we face complexity, clarity when we face ambiguity, and kindness when we face the VUCA storms that this world has to throw at us. So the next time you're feeling stuck, I hope you'll try diagramming. Thank you so much for your time today. If you'd like to follow my work after this, um, everything that I make can be found on abbycovert.com. I also have an Etsy shop linked to from my website where you can buy books, posters, and workbooks directly from me. Um, and if you want to keep up with my work, I have a mailing list where I send a monthly email update on what I'm working on and interested in. And with that, I would love to take some questions uh, about my talk or anything else that this brought up for anyone. Thanks. Thank you very much, Abby, for inspiring all of us to become um, superheroes in our own right if we try to tackle things with diagrams. So 
We'll open the floor to um, questions. Um, anyone on Zoom, feel free to raise your hand or ask one. You can also post them in chat. And I believe if you have questions in the room, they can be um, broadcast or they can be shared with, with Ella. And I have, um, I have one of my own, but I'll, I'll pause for a moment to see if anyone has a, a initial question that they wish to, to share first. I will definitely warn them that Jay and R could, and I could definitely nerd out about this for the rest of the hour. So if anybody has any yeah. questions, jump in the queue. Well then, I will jump in, Abby, with them. Um, oh no, I think uh, we have somebody. Oh, do we well, have it's, one? It's, I, it's I Evan, I'm okay, just yeah, please go. saying hello. Okay, I'm saying hello and thank you. Um, thank you. So we've got a room full of people here who uh, diagram all the time, and I'm sure they have awesome. a ton of interesting questions and would love to nerd out with both of you guys. Um, I would love right it. Now. So, um, JR, why don't you start off and then uh, we'll we'll let the nerds take over, I guess. Me? Uh -huh. No, I'll hand it. Oh, right there's a question there, or should I ask? So, if anyone has a question, I can bring the microphone over, or um, you can just yell it out and I can repeat it. Yeah. Hang on. I have to remove it from its holder. <laughs> I wish that there was a way I could see you all, but you're like this big. <laughs> Hi, Abby. Uh, this is Christine. Um, one of the things Hello. I'm usually struggling with with uh, diagrams is that they're very static in nature, while mm -hmm. a lot of things that we're dealing with are very dynamic in their nature. How do you capture the dynamic nature of things in diagrams? Mm, yeah, I think that a lot of that comes down to diagrams as working spaces versus diagrams as deliverables or documentation moments. So if you're in the process of um, creating a deliverable of something that you know is going to be in process, I think it's a really good idea to be very heavy handed in your notation and in your visual language about how in process that thing is. Um, so I've often seen like, you know, different shades used to indicate when things are going to be coming in the future or dotted lines for things that are going to be um, slotted in later. Um, but then there's also this side of diagrams as a working zone. And I think like we've all benefited for the last decade, at least for, uh, you know, these online whiteboarding tools and, and things of that nature. I think that those can provide a lot of value if you have a team of people who are diagramming together and it's something that's moving um, in time. Uh, so those kind of like frameworks, um, canvases, those kinds of things, I think can be of real value. So, but I think one of the determiners um, at, up front is to decide, is this a deliverable moment or is this a workspace moment? Because I think you have a different approach to a diagram depending on which one it is. Other questions? Yeah, Tom, come on over. Yeah, you should just pass it back. But... Thank you, Abby. Um, I'm Thomas uh, from UK, and uh, thank you for your talk. And the, my question is, I found that some people are struggling with diving. Whatever diving you're presenting, they prefer something else. Um, <laughs> with the different type of experience, and how many percent of people do you think that in that category, but also then how do we, you talk about teaching or educating students to how to diagram, but any tips on how to actually teach any systemic way of doing that, or just try and then learn, yeah. any, any thought on that? Mm. I think it all comes down to your audience. I, I think a lot of people go into diagramming, assuming that if they can make a diagram that's clear in their own head, that it'll be clear to somebody else. And I just haven't seen a single case where that's true. Um, the idea of like a universal diagrammatic truth, like, I mean, there's there's people that have been trying to work on, you know, what happens when people show up that don't share language with us and they need to know about nuclear waste. Like that's probably the, the most um, like serving of all humans that you would need to get with a diagram. But for the most part, it really does come down to understanding your audience and figuring out what they need in that diagram. Um, there's a couple of things that I see, especially in the workplace, but also in academic spaces where people are showing diagrams that they did but the intent is not for people to understand the diagram, it's for them to understand how much work went into the person understanding the space that's been diagrammed. And those are fundamentally different intentions. I think both can be achieved with a diagram because both are helpful intents, but I think knowing which one you are doing is really important because if I, an information architect, am walking into you know, a boardroom of executives and I'm showing them a diagram of a really complex ontology and I'm asking them for feedback in the room, they're definitely going to either get on the defensive and give me feedback I really don't want, or they're going to just 
be completely confused as to why I'm asking feedback for that to begin with. So I think like understanding who you are making the diagram for, and then admitting when you've made a diagram for yourself that you might need to make another diagram for another type of person. And that sometimes that means that that same diagram spawns seven other diagrams. Um, I've done some fairly large consulting projects for, uh, for example, Nike, I had a, a single diagram that spawned seven different versions just based on audience, um, because there was a really technical audience that wanted like a story level depiction of the business logic. And then there was a super executive audience that just wanted to know, like at a high level, what's the process. Forcing those two audiences to look at each other's diagrams is something I see happening a lot um, in a lot of different contexts. Um, and I think if people did more thinking about the users of diagrams as users and designing them as objects to be used um, as opposed to, I don't know, things we have to teach people or give them a tour of um, in order to be effective. That's that's sort of my, my best advice is know your audience. Can I- Hello, Abby and Stefan from Paris, France. Um, you talk a lot about the audience of your work. Uh, but what about the participative uh, side of it? I mean, it's, it's always important to engage users in the process, in the design process. So uh, does it happen that sometimes you engage users in the in your drag app, but do they take part to it? Can they draw with you? Yes, yes, absolutely. They should draw with you. They should draw for you. One of the things that I think is really important to acknowledge about research methods in general is that when we ask users to make things, we're not asking them to do our job for us. So if I, for example, want to understand how to make an effective diagram to serve a certain audience, me asking three, four or five of those people to make a diagram that explains it to me based on what they understand is going to give me a lot of fodder for me to figure out what's next. And I think that that's similar with like what you see in, I don't know, say like card sort or usability testing results where you're going to get a lot of inputs from your users and none of those are meant to be literally translated into action. They're more about informing you as the maker to be more user-centered in your approach. So I think um, when it comes down to it, understanding your audience comes along with finding those moments where you are interacting with them. I say in, in my book about diagrams that the best way to judge a diagram is to give it to a member of your audience and ask them to give a tour of it to you. Um, and that's a very humbling experience for most diagrammers to do. So I highly encourage it for anyone who's testing a diagram these days. I guess I, as they're going to the next um, a, a yeah. question in the room, I'll jump in. There's kind of two points that I um, would like to ask about. One, um, this distinction you said between diagrams that are kind of to be polished to deliver, to be delivered, mm -hmm. and diagrams as working um, documents, yeah. we'll say, or working artifacts. Uh, and again, my class, my diagram and visual thinking class, we've been talking a lot about this, about diagrams being, on one hand, generative tools for new thoughts and diagrams as representations. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I wonder if there's, um, if between those two different intentions or uses, if there are different perspectives or, or different techniques, you think that lean one way or another and paying attention to that. And I think a related question mm -hmm. to that, um, at least for me, um, and maybe it's a separate question, is to look at the final letter of the acronym, the K, the kindness. Um, yeah. And if you have suggestions on how to bring that forward, because I feel that we mm -hmm. always we often, those of us who like diagramming or want to diagram, we want to diagram on a kindness. We want to help people, but yeah. the, the kindness that we're giving in the diagram, it, this relates to the question of yeah, working with the users, working with the audience. That our kindness might not be the the a kindness that's received or a gift received. Mm. And so I wonder if, if there's also yeah, if you have um, suggestions on kind of how to pause or things to reflect upon to ask yeah. like I'm doing this out of kindness. But what is the the what is the need that that I'm feeling? Yeah. What is what is the 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 gift that can be received? Okay. Well, I feel like I want to start with the kindness thing just because it's um I don't know it's very top of mind for me. Anyways, I feel like um there's something about the role of our own ego that needs to be confronted when it comes to that kindness when it for other people. So if I'm making a diagram as a kindness to myself, I'm sort of um you know I'm like that 
detective in the dirty motel room on the Netflix special with all the post-it notes all over the wall and like the string and like somebody walks into that room and they see that thing and they're going to be like, whoa, <laughs> you know, but for me, I'm like working it out. I'm, I'm solving the case. I've got like a theory on this crime in order to get from that kindness that I've done to myself to being kind for other people. I need to translate that motel room wall into something that doesn't frighten other people or uh, elicit what I like to call diagrammatic insecurity, which is basically the feeling like this diagram is not for me. I don't know why you're putting it in front of me, but surely I'm not supposed to get something out of this. So I feel like there's, um, there's something about like when we do the kindness for ourselves, right? We've, we've solved the crime. We've overwhelmed ourselves with the information to the point that we have the theory. Now we feel like we need to take people in there and get them to the same place and take them through that same journey. And I think that that is a, is a misstep for a lot of people in a lot of contexts, whether that's bringing a stakeholder along on a journey, whether that's um, trying to get a, a lay person user up to speed on something that's more complex than they need to for their purposes. There's a lot of implications um, for that, where we think the kindness that I've done for myself is so great. I'll just transfer that to other people. But that actually does come out um, as sort of, you know, in the worst cases, as kind of like an aggression of like, this isn't for you, but trust me, I can see all these things and I've done all this work. Um, so yeah, I think like thinking about how you are actually getting perspective on the diagram and making sure that you have answered the really critical questions about who you're serving and why you're serving them. Because if your answer is I'm serving executives and my reason why is because I want them to know what I've been up to for the last three months, there's a very different diagrammatic approach that you would take um, than sort of like, you know, showing them the bat cave or whatever it is. Um, and so I feel like by revisiting that intention space, you can kind of figure out like, what is the angle of the kindness? Like, is it about taking something that's really complex and making it more simple? Is that the kindness that we're trying to, to prove? Or is it actually about taking something that's really simple and showing people how complex it is so that they have an appreciation for how hard it's going to be to change? Those are like opposite scenarios, but both could be a super kindness. Um, yeah. And then the other question you have about like working documents uh, versus the kind of deliverable documents. I feel like so many working documents become deliverables. And I think in a lot of cases, that is a mistake. Um, I think that like hitting print or save or whatever it is on the thing that you've been working on with a lot of people, like a canvas, and then expecting other people or even the same people to look at it weeks later and get it. Um, there's just a lot of translation that has to be made. So I would say the, the bridge between them is um, notation, like additional context. I like to talk about um, when diagrams get out of the lab. Like if you're in a, a group environment where you're working on something and you make a diagram of something that nobody's ever seen before, don't be surprised if people start sending it around to other people. That means that when you send out that diagram the first time, it better have with it the traveling context. Um, and that context should illustrate to them whether or not this was a deliverable or this was a working moment, because those should be perceived differently. Um, but depending on how they've been packaged for an audience, you can take something that's definitely a working document and have it perceived by an executive team as something that's already done. Um, I've seen that happen. It's very unfortunate. So yeah, I think it's all about um, kind of the clarity of the context when trying to make sure that those two things don't get mixed up. Hi, Abby. Um, thanks for the presentation. My name is Victor in Washington, Washington DC. Uh, you hinted at this already a little bit. Um, I was curious, did you how do you test the diagram? You, you, you've done the work, you've understood the people and the need and what needs to be done. You've even worked with mm -hmm. the people, uh, some of the people in the participatory approach. Um, do yeah. you actually use the stuck framework or approach in testing? Uh, you mean like mapping to like the, the superpowers uh, that the diagram yeah, has? Is it, okay. No, okay. no, no, no. I don't, I don't see it as a heuristic set. That, that would be a, an interesting thing to develop actually as part of the, um, the part of the book, there's a chapter on craft and I do have 25 common mistakes that people make on diagrams. Um, and so I would say that's probably a more useful self-critique model. I would say in terms of testing uh, diagrams, the best way to test them is to give them to users and then close your mouth and see what they say about them. Now, the reason I say the close your mouth part is because what I see much more often is you put the diagram in front of them or maybe like on a screen, and then you say, so this is the diagram. What do you think? And then 30 seconds pass, 
they don't say anything. And then you go, so what I'm trying to say here is that this thing links to this thing, which links to this thing, which is labeled this thing. And you see this icon over here? That's what I meant by this. And one time I was talking about this thing. And so I turned all of these green um, and you kind of give like a tour of your own diagram. And when you do that, you really do miss the opportunity for somebody to call, call out like very critical flaws um, in your diagrammatic approach. So I would say um, as much as you can treat it like an interface and have it usability tested, whether that's you being the moderator or not, kind of comes down to um, whether or not you have that skill set. You know, some people have the ability to set aside their opinions about their own work uh, for a user to tell them theirs. Some people do not. So if you don't have that skill set, um, find somebody that you can partner with that would have that. There's also a question in the chat. Um, real quick, that says, thanks for a good presentation, Abby, from uh, Francis De Silva. If you're familiar with giga mapping as a SOD systems oriented design uh, diagramming technique, how would you position stuck as a mapping co mapping technique in relation to systems oriented design SOD? I am not familiar with that, so I won't try to make that comparison. But thank you for your question. I would love to take that over email if they want to write it up for me. Hey, Abby, uh, thank, thanks hey. so much. Uh, this was a, a, a really uh, inspiring presentation and I enjoyed it very much. I just, I, I was, I was going to ask if you could maybe unpack uh, something that you said a little bit earlier, um, where you know you were looking at the, the we were looking at the COVID document, um, mm -hmm. and and talking about how that was, you know, like maybe the uh, was apolitical. Um, and I was just, I, I was just wondering what you meant by that. It, it seemed to me like there's a lot of politics embedded in these diagrams, you know, at like mm -hmm. any levels, like even down to like the choice of Jolie mentioned the projection choice of the map, you know, is, is a, yeah. uh, you know, can emphasize or detract from certain things, you know, how the size of the squares, where the borders yeah. are on, how the data is collected, you know, Florida was juking the stats. Uh, all I live in Florida, schools, right? <laughs> so yeah. I'm very aware. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, yeah. Uh, what a mess. But then, you know, that kind of bubbles up into this diagram that presents this sort of, you know, a knowable totality of, of the situation at a particular moment. Um, yeah. So I'm just wondering, like, what, what do you mean when you say apolitical or political? And how, are, how are the politics? Like, how, how do you negotiate that in, in this? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm trying to go back through my my uh, thoughts of like whether or not I called that apolitical because I, I definitely don't believe that to be the case. So I, I sort of doubt that I used that word. But if I did, that's definitely a mistake. Um, the way that I think about those types of diagrams is that they're meant to be about information transparency, um, and that unfortunately information is subject to manipulation, uh, disinformation, and misinformation just like anything else um so unfortunately i think like with the covid situation there was a lot of you know do we have the ability to trust this data can we trust this visualization i actually think that the times did a fantastic job of um kind of dealing with the heavy level of caveat and differences of uh jurisdiction like i know from having to watch the atrocity through florida um, I can say that like they did a really nice job of always informing me of how much Florida was screwing it up, but also providing a way for me to understand how that was related to the data that I was seeing. Um, so I think it's it's interesting because the reason that it's effective is because it was so simplistic. Um, it really was effective because people understand that map and they understand that darker shade red bad. Um, and that is the only reason that that visualization was as effective as it is. Um, I think like any other diagram that you're going to make, an understanding of your audience is going to change how you position different data um, and how you aggregate different data. And it really comes down to like um, the precision that you want to present versus sort of the transparency that your audience is looking for to trust you. Um, there's ways that they could have really mucked up that graphic by getting too technical on um, some of the differences of the statistics. And if they had done that, they would have lost a massive audience that just wasn't techy enough um, or math nerdy enough to feel like that mattered. Um, and so I feel like they they did a really nice job of walking the line. 
between presenting something that was incredibly complex and fraught, but not in a way that elicited massive diagrammatic insecurity from the American people who needed to see that thing. Um, and I mean, across the world, I think those visualizations were also used quite a bit. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's that's where my brain went with it. Thanks. Hi, Abby. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I uh, come from uh, Norway. And we've hello. been using, uh, hello. Uh, so just to follow up a little bit on Francis' question from the chat, we've been using Giga Maps as, uh, my, let's say, uh, diagramming techniques uh, in dialogue. Mm -hmm. And what my question is whether, uh, from your experience, you kind of touched a little bit upon that when you did the historical, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say go to where it starts with maps and then maps and then machines and so forth and so on. So uh, yeah. I would like to, first of all, thank you for a very, very inspiring presentation, but also ask you whether you could expand a little bit on that because I was curious uh, to, to hear whether you have any experience or some kind of uh, uh, learnings about the types of diagrams that exist. So uh, is mm -hmm. there any kind of categorization or typology that you have encountered? I mean, uh, yeah. Working with this uh, field. So, for instance, yeah. have, there's lots of contextual diagrams uh, trying to map out something on a certain context or relational or and so forth and so on. Do you have any mm -hmm. ideas or expansions around that? Yeah, yeah. So in um in my book about diagrams, um, I present the idea that diagrams can be centered on different things. Um, and I think that uh, in general, there's three centers that I see over and over again, time, arrangement, and context. Um, and in the book, I've mapped uh, 12 diagram types that are sort of like the, the meta types. Um, and I've made recipes for those and then sorted them into that framework. One of the things that was really interesting uh, was going in writing the book, looking for other taxonomies of people breaking down types of diagrams. And if there's anything I learned, it's that if you write about diagrams, you have a way of breaking them down to talk about them. Um, I also learned mostly from the incredible Wikipedia page that is the diagram page, if anybody has not been to it, there are thousands of types of diagrams, um, which really floored me. And then looking into the historical kind of referencing of the most common types that we see sort of in the, the business and the academic world, what I found was that most of them were actually created, the ones that we use commonly, um, were created like more than 100 years ago and, and most for the industrial revolution. So I would say that there's a lot of um, updating of tooling in diagrams right now that I'm looking forward to seeing more of breaking out of that set um, and something that you'll definitely pick up if you read my work further on diagrams is that I'm a, a teacher who wants you to break the template um, and make your own diagram template. I think that there's a lot of value in finding diagrams that have already been done and then using those for your purposes. But I actually find diagramming as a thinking tool to be much more powerful. So rather than subscribe to a methodology um, or even a tool, I really encourage people to diagram to express themselves through the problem and to help them make sense of it. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what I that's what I got. Abby, Abby one distinction that mm -hmm. um, you didn't mention in this talk, but I found very useful in, in your work is this distinction between the visual and invisual elements mm -hmm. to, of a diagram and how to, and sure. kind of. Um, and so, would you be willing to share a little bit about that that distinction and how you see those different elements coming together? And what they yeah, do. I think I think like at the end of the day, diagrams are just boxes and arrows. I mean, sometimes those boxes are round and sometimes those boxes look like, I don't know, elephants or whatever they are, but they really are just objects and connections between those objects. Um, and that's like the visual part of diagramming. Um, but then we have this sort of invisual part, which is the stuff that's coded into the visuals we choose. And that's really about your audience and your scope um, and your intention. Like, what are you actually trying to get done? with this diagram for a specific audience? And then how have you bounded yourself to make sure that that's actually something you can accomplish? So I think with those, those two things um, interplaying, it opens up diagramming to be more of a vocabulary um, and a grammar that you can use to apply to any problem set. Um, I also have a little bit of work in terms of like trying to figure out how to direct students to the right template to start. Um, so I have a decision flow diagram in the back of the book that sort of takes an intention and brings you to um, an example to start from of the, the 12 recipes. Hi, Abby. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. Um, my name is Chloe. Yeah. I'm studying linguistics. So my instinct when making a diagram is to make a tree, because that's what linguists do to make trees. But that's not always the yeah. best way to express information. No. 
I was wondering if you have any advice for, like you said, breaking the template and kind of getting out of your disciplinary comfort zone with dieting. Hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I don't know if this like freaks people out when I say it at first, but um, diagrams without lines to begin. Like I find like when you make a square and then you make another square and you need to connect them together, that's where you start to imply the template. Um, and you don't have to do that. You can actually move squares around all day long without lines and you can add the lines later on. So I find that that helps people to start. Um, another way to think about it is um, to just do it a completely different way in terms of like if you're doing a tree based on hierarchy think about how things would be arranged uh, based on time or think about how things would be arranged based on location um, and generally that can kind of shake people loose from the hierarchy tree uh, but yes i do find that like depending on what somebody's background is they generally come in with like one or two types of diagrams that they try to apply to every problem so i think a lot of it is actually expanding that tool belt and having a little bit more of a grasp of the visual vocabulary of diagramming as opposed to just the structures like a hierarchy diagram um you know it's a useful structure but it's not necessarily gonna to your point not going to be able to structure everything so more examples <laughs> more practice yeah there's a question online francis yeah i just wanted to um uh, just comment Evan's comment earlier today when he was talking about what is this? Is this an interdiscipline? Is it what 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 RST was? And uh, so it's 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 an observation and not a question as such. I just wanted to reflect on the the use of visuals and the inclusion process and the non-templating approach as a means for sense making. And so mm -hmm. Bupa is a context that you've. Uh, provided and the stuck as a way to do that and it, it makes it more tangible as a student of uh, giga mapping and jonathan was jonathan's question um, mm -hmm. building on that there is a lot of work being done in that space and i really find what you've presented now both from an information architecture perspective and as a digital technology person i think it's very useful to use more diagramming uh, as, a, as a way of uh, providing sense to RSD. Um, so it was just a, um, an observation and a comment I just wanted to share. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm Kundika. I'm a student here at Georgetown, and I'm also taking Professor Osborne's diagrams class, which we're reading your book in, which is fantastic. Um, I have a question which you already touched upon a little bit about getting to know your users and getting to understand the audience. But what I've been thinking a lot about like when reading your book and listening to your talk is about translatability across cultures, for example. Like one thing is, you know, do your research, know your audience, and that it's not one size fits all. Like obviously one diagram that you make is not going to work for everyone. But just to mm -hmm. give an example, like I'm an international student here and let's say I look at the map of Georgetown. And some like the literal physical tangible map and sometimes i don't find it useful because a lot of things are lost in translation so while the purpose of it is to help everyone and i know you talked about determining usefulness but i just wanted to dig a little deeper yeah no i think that it's really important uh something you said about it. it's to be helpful to everyone and like that's the part that's the problem is that it's never nothing's ever going to be helpful to everyone so it's who are you prioritizing to be helpful to Right. And so the map that's not serving you has not prioritized you as a user. Um, and that's a that's a specific decision on the diagrammers uh, point, whether or not they're aware of having made that decision. You know, that all comes down to the diagrammer. Also, I'm looking forward to speaking with JR's class, uh, I think, in, in two weeks time. So I will be seeing your diagram soon. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you, at least the class as well. Thank you again for a. Uh, 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 informative and, and, and stimulating presentation um, that's it, been uh, in, in the discussion afterwards. Thank you for all the questions. We will be actually doing some diagramming in a workshop later later today. So we'll see if they how we um, can stick to these or, or channel some of the superpowers. But thank you again, Abby. Um, I know there's another uh, panel beginning or uh, streaming online for the online participants. And I believe we're going to take a break in uh, Washington, D.C. So thank you very much for um, awesome. today. Thank you for your time. Have a great rest of your event.
Okay, like JR said, we're going to take a few minutes break. We're going to set up for our next session, and uh, we'll see you guys back in like maybe 15 minutes or so. Okay.